Hi everyone, Zoe here with the third and final installment in my little democracy series. And yes, I know there's infinitely more to say on the subject, but um, my specific focus here was on how our governments undermine democratic ideals through deliberately broken electoral systems. Now, before I dive in, just a quick word of thanks to the three kind people supporting my channel via Patreon. And yeah, I know Patreon's a bit problematic, um, which is why I list alternatives like Libra Pay for those who have moral objections to the big P. As usual, if you do find this video interesting, please do all the things, you know, like, comment, and subscribe. But maybe only click the notification bell if you don't mind my daily Beat Saber videos popping up in your feed. Right, onwards. So, the suggestions I'll be making today are all ones that you can safely pursue without fear of getting your name on some kind of government watch list. And if you're disappointed to hear that, rest assured this won't be my last video on the topic. Personally, I feel our species doesn't have time to uh, rehabilitate our governments via gentle nudges and tiny reforms. But sure, um, for the purposes of today's video, let's suppose we still believe the proper channels aren't explicitly designed to keep citizens spinning our wheels whilst politicians continue to do whatever the ruling classes tell them to. In that slightly less dark timeline, what sorts of initiatives should we prioritize? Well, if you watched part two on Wednesday, you already know how profoundly anti-democratic the first-past-the-post electoral systems are. So let's start there. If you live in a place that still uses it, um, please work with whatever national organizations are fighting for a switch to proportional representation. Also, be sure to chat with family, friends, and colleagues about how first-past-the-post fails the electorate and encourages corruption so that they'll understand why they should support reform whenever it's offered. Otherwise, when an initiative to change the voting system finally does occur, confusion over what it entails or why a different approach is even preferable could completely scupper any chance of progress. This is what happened in 2011 in the UK's alternative vote referendum. To be fair, in that case, um, the electorate wasn't being offered actual proportional representation, but rather something called instant runoff voting, or IRV. Now, while it would have at least offered a tiny improvement over first past the post, it's possible many voters were simply holding out for a stronger option, like, you know, party list, mixed member proportional, or even single transferable vote like they use in Ireland. And if all this sounds like so much gibberish to you, don't panic. Um, someday soon, I'll make another video comparing the various uh, voting systems in use worldwide. And uh, for now, just remember the main goals of voting system reform should be, one, an end to the tyranny of winner-take-all contests. Two, elected bodies whose composition better reflects you know, differing and particularly minority attitudes across the whole electorate. And three, um, the flourishing of coalitions between political parties, as that prevents any single party from acting in an autocratic manner, merely from having won a plurality of the votes. Oh yeah, in the meantime, we can at least make our political contests slightly more representative by stamping out gerrymandering. Politicians shouldn't get any say over where their voting district boundaries are drawn, and in countries like Australia, the sort of packing and cracking shenanigans that I described in part two of the series are avoided by having nonpartisan electoral commissions applying objective criteria to redistricting. So let's do that everywhere, shall we? We could also work um, with groups like the ACLU to block or repeal inflexible laws that prevent citizens from voting unless they first present one of a limited set of government-issued photo IDs. I mean, proponents of harsher photo voter ID laws, um, like the Republicans in the US and the Tories here in the UK, often claim that um, they're needed in order to stop voter fraud. But the actual evidence definitively shows this claim to be false. For example, a 2001 investigation carried out at Loyola University Law School found that since 2000, there have been only 31 credible incidents of voter fraud in over 1 billion ballots cast. Yeah, that's across American general, primary, special, and municipal elections. And I'll just say it again, 31 cases over 14 years out of 1 billion ballots. 
This echoes more recent data from the, um, the UK Electoral Commission, which found that out of tens of millions of votes cast in the 2017 general election, only a handful of voter impersonation allegations even arose, of which just one went to conviction. Just to be clear, um, the only type of fraud that um, voter ID laws could even stop, face-to-face -face voter impersonation at a polling station, is practically non-existent. Our governments know this, so many politicians that still pushing for this unnecessary legislation clearly have an ulterior motive, the most likely of which is voter suppression. Voter ID laws inevitably deprive many people of their right to vote. For instance, 11% of US citizens and 7.5% of those here in the UK don't have any type of ID that would be acceptable under voter ID schemes. Not only does obtaining these IDs cost money, a regressive cost that targets lower income groups, but it also entails onerous journeys to the nearest government office, long waits for necessary paperwork to be processed, and the ID to finally be issued. These are all burdens which disproportionately impact ethnic minorities, the poor, the elderly, and obviously new voters. So, when coupled with evidence showing that polling station enforcement of voter ID laws is not applied equally to whites and people of color, making it very popular in racist strongholds like the American South, it's clear they represent deliberate barriers erected to exclude the voices of societies more marginalized and vulnerable. Fight voter ID laws at every opportunity. In addition to ensuring our elected bodies reflect the diversity of votes cast and removing discriminatory obstacles to voter participation, another issue we urgently need to address is campaign funding and political contributions in general. The lack of sufficient financial controls or oversight in this area has fueled the expansion of rapacious neoliberalism from the 1980s onwards, and it remains the biggest source of governmental corruption to this day. Historically, the dominance of corporate power over the political process dates all the way back to 17th century mercantilism, where brutal, exploitative um, entities like the East India Company basically operated as unchecked global pseudo-states backed by royal charters. The wealth and resources that they stole from other lands fueled the expansion of the British Empire, ensuring a permanent incestuous relationship between companies and politicians which was then exacerbated by the Industrial Revolution and the transition to capitalism as the world's prevailing economic system. But I promised there'd be less history, so um, let's just say um, a series of US Supreme Court decisions starting in the early 1800s gradually transformed corporations into citizens in the eyes of the law, granting heartless sociopathic hierarchical structures with access to billions or even trillions of dollars the same rights as actual human beings. The most recent and egregious example of this was the um, 2010 Citizens United versus FEC ruling, which declared that political spending is a form of free speech and therefore protected by the First Amendment. This gives corporations the right to spend an unlimited amount of money supporting their favorite political candidates, essentially enshrining the US government as a kleptocracy which operates and legislates for the benefit of the highest bidder. In the decades since the Supreme Court decision, there's been a proliferation of unaccountable super PACs, um, political action committees, which inject obscene sums of cash at every level of government and aren't required to disclose their donors. How convenient. This phenomenon is clearly incompatible with anything resembling democracy and unfortunately isn't confined to America. Worldwide, governments are lively striking down campaign finance restrictions, ensuring each election cycle will become more and more saturated with and determined by corporate financial contributions which dwarf anything individuals or citizen groups could possibly raise. We need to turn back the tide if we're to have any hope of restoring democracy to our governments. Corporations are not people and they shouldn't be treated as such. The billions they pour into campaign contributions aren't a form of free speech and should be outright banned. It's clear that corporate interests don't align with those of workers, so it's obscene to let corporations use the pretense of their supposed right to free speech to drown out the voices of millions of actual citizens. 
Alternatives to sort out the sort of endemic corruption include the um, clean money, clean elections movement, um, which levels the playing field by giving each political candidate the same fixed amount of money to campaign with. And obviously there's the um, Democracy Vouchers Initiative, which basically gives each citizen several fixed value vouchers to use on campaign donations to their preferred candidates. Approaches like these, I mean, if adopted universally across all levels of government, would basically eliminate the ability of corporations and the rich to buy elections and endlessly override the will of the populace. However, um, to truly remove the profit motive as a factor in, you know, saturating our governments with corrupt self-serving office holders, we also need to reduce their salaries. At present, in most so-called democratic nations, at every level of government, from municipal to federal, politicians earn vastly more than other professionals, whilst workers in countless other professions undergo up to a decade training to achieve certification in their respective fields, there are zero required qualifications for assuming political office. I mean, unless you can't have enough money to run your ad campaign. Um, but not only is there absolutely no justification for paying politicians more than nurses, doctors, or teachers, but I'd argue there's no reason to pay them more than certified electricians, plumbers, or carpenters. <laughs> I mean, if we accept Lord Acton's maxim that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, then we should make all reasonable measures we can to ensure that those seeking political office are motivated far more by a sense of civic duty and a desire to make the world a better place than by personal expectations of financial gain. One straightforward way to do this is to tie politicians' salaries to the median income of everyone living within their constituency. Note how I didn't say mean income, because that's skewed heavily upwards by the presence of a tiny fraction of ultra-wealthy individuals. Median income is a much better representation of the average person's pay, and therefore politicians can hardly argue that they can't possibly live on such a small salary when at least half of their constituents are doing so. If a politician wants a pay raise, all they have to do is push through legislation which helps everyone in their constituency earn more money. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. <sighs> While we're on the subject of making political office less attractive to greedy, self-important people, let's jettison the concept of career politicians. Few things are more sure to encourage corrupt, high-handed behavior than unaccountable lifetime appointments like the U.S. Supreme Court or the U.K.'s House of Lords. Individuals who obtain these permanent posts bring with them biases and early indoctrination which become baked into our system of governance, overruling the attitudes and wishes of successive generations of citizens. Politicians for life are typically unresponsive to rapidly changing societal mores and are yet another governmental mechanism for maintaining the status quo and stymieing progressive changes desired by the majority of the populace. Nor should we stop there. I mean, realistically, we must push for stricter term limits at every level of government if we want to improve accountability in our political system. I mean, the same person holding the post of councilman, mayor, governor, congressman, or state or provincial representative term after term is anathema to the very idea of democracy as it entrenches the power and prejudices of individual office holders over the will of the people they supposedly represent. I mean, in an ideal world, just dreaming here, Holding political office would be something everyone would have the opportunity to do at least once, but not anyone's sole ambition or driving focus in life. Similar to jury duty, citizens could be selected at random to serve a brief stint in political office. They could always apply for a deferral of their service in exceptional circumstances, but assuming they accepted the offered post, the law would ensure their current job would still be waiting for them when their political term ended. They'd be supported in office by experienced and impartial administrative teams, as well as citizen panels drawn from those with relevant background or expertise to tackle the most pressing issues faced at that level of government. But I know, I'm living in a utopian dream world. Right, 
But if the idea, obviously, of applying the Athenian practice of sortition to all political offices feels just too radical or perhaps too naive to you, then there are still measures we can take to make politicians much more accountable under the current regime. One way is by providing the public with a universal, permanent, easily searchable database of each candidate's political track record, listing all actions taken, positions claimed, votes cast, legislation proposed, donations received, and press statements given. Just as important, however, would be fostering a culture of civic responsibility by training voters to consult that database prior to each election. Doing so, citizens could instantly discover how many times a politician hadn't bothered to attend sessions of government, how many times they'd voted contrary to their own published campaign promises or against the interests of their own constituencies, or how many times they'd stood athwart the party line and on which key issues. A few minutes reading would give citizens useful insights um, into the sort of behavior they could expect from that particular politician if they are elected. It would also mean that corrupt officials who were forced to step down in one constituency couldn't simply, you know, up sticks and move to a new one in the hopes of being elected by citizens unfamiliar with their prior record. As for candidates who've never held political office before, we should encourage cultural expectations of transparency. To counter corruption and potential conflicts of interest, basic information like how long they've lived in that constituency, their last few years of income, their prior and current employment history, any significant corporate shares or seats held, and their current special interest group positions or affiliations would be mandatory disclosures. And anyone who balked at such requests is, you know, welcome to seek occupation in some field other than politics. Anyway, congratulations, you made it to the very final section of this video, yay! <laughs> I left this topic for last because I'd like to end on a positive note, and even if you think some of my earlier suggestions for restoring democracy are unfeasible or utopian, maybe you'll agree that some of the ones here are easily achievable and worth investigating. So to start, we absolutely have to make voting easier full stop. The democratic process relies upon citizen engagement and participation, so erecting artificial barriers like midweek election days is simply inexcusable. The vast majority of nations which hold elections schedule them for the weekend, and Chile, Germany, India, the Philippines, Samoa, South Africa, and Vanuatu all have declared their election days public holidays. This is a great approach, which sends the message that voting should be celebrated as something to look forward to, rather than couching the whole occasion in terms of military and combat metaphors, which I think is psychologically damaging. <laughs> I mean, personally, I'd expect any culture which truly values the democratic process and fair representation to take steps to encourage universal participation in elections. And another approach to this is making voting mandatory. I mean, it's compulsory in about two dozen nations worldwide, with the practice especially embraced throughout Latin America. Opponents typically paint such laws as an imposition upon their personal freedom, but I'd argue this falls into the same category as the um, freedom to refuse to wear a mask during a pandemic. It's a very selfish and shallow sort of freedom that mulishly refuses to acknowledge our responsibilities to other human beings or to society as a whole. Besides, despite fairly lax enforcement and very mild consequences for failing to vote, these countries do tend to see higher voter registration and turnout rates, for example with Australia achieving a 96% registration rate and a 90% turnout at the polls. So there may be something to it, just saying. Speaking of uh, voter registration, that should just be automatic, um, as is the case in Chile, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Iceland, Israel, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Peru, South Korea, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and Taiwan. I mean, by contrast, the US largely refuses to make voter registration automatic, leading to approximately 24% of voting eligible American citizens being unregistered at any time. However, some states have either partially or fully automated voter registration, though in most cases it's linked to um, the process of obtaining a driver's license or other ID cards, so if you're not going for one, you don't get the free registration. But still, there's hope 
yet for um, pushing such policies through nationwide. So if you're in the States, you should definitely be fighting for it and don't let it be rolled back. And another step forward in places that don't yet offer automatic voter registration would be to let citizens register to vote even on election day itself, as occurs in Canada. And hopefully it goes without saying that um, whatever elections don't warrant a public holiday, um, employers should be required nonetheless to provide sufficient leeway in the work rota to ensure that all employees are able to exercise their right to vote. There should also be a legal obligation on the part of local government offices to establish a number of polling stations proportional to the number of people living in any particular district and to locate them centrally for each community being served. Also, along good public transportation links to make it easier for those without personal, personal vehicles to actually make the journey. Obviously, we should also fight to end felony disenfranchisement as people don't instantly lose their citizenship when convicted. And as we continue to see from events playing out in the US and elsewhere in the world, the police routinely incarcerate people for things which shouldn't even be crimes, like homelessness. Better yet, Let's abolish the prison industrial complex entirely, um, starting with for-profit prisons and the continued practice of prison slavery. But I'll save that cheerful topic for another video. Finally, here's a zany suggestion. Um, why don't we lower the voting age to 16? Because while most countries nowadays have set the age of majority at 18, for most of human history, this hasn't been the case. We're also living longer on average, which means an ever-growing percentage of aging voters can dig in their heels and block legislation or policies which don't cater to attitudes several generations past their sell-by dates. Lowering the voting age to 16 would counterbalance this by amplifying the voices of those who, unlike the elderly, will have to live with the consequences of whatever laws get passed for many, many, many decades to come. We should be doing our level best to give young people a say in the world they'll soon inherit, especially considering the abject mess we've left it in. Anyway, um, I better wrap things up or this video won't be ready to go live in two hours time. <laughs> Hopefully I've given you um, some food for thought on how we might begin to restore democracy to our societies and without even a single reference to revolutions or guillotines except just then. Seriously though, keep the faith. I mean, these are pretty dark times we're living in, but we're also seeing a resurgence of civil rights activism, increased public vigilance of corporations and their activities, and various other promising signs. I'd say human civilization has a fighting chance of seeing the year 2100 after all. <laughs> By the way, um, whenever you do look at our so-called leaders, and begin to despair. Just remember that um, this isn't the first time in history that democracy had to be seized back from a bunch of thieving oligarchs. The Greeks managed to do it in the 4th century BCE. So what's stopping us here in the 21st? And with that, uh, my three-part series on democracy concludes. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will wish you all the best. Until next time. Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button or leave me some feedback as a comment or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help. And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.